Welcome to Epic Life Ministries. I'm Pastor Diane Hunter, and I'm so glad you could join me today. And if you want to contact me, you can do that at epiclifeministries.com. And I would love to hear from you. And also, we have a blog on my website and different things that could encourage you as well. And we're going to pray today, and then we're going to do part two of Behind the Scenes as we continue looking at the Christmas story. (sighs) Father, thank you. Thank you for these ones, these people listening. Father, I pray that you would pour your presence, your purpose, your power, and your hope into them. As things are starting to get busy around the holiday season, Father, I pray that you would keep each one tucked in the secret place with you and assured of who you are and all that you have. And Father, if finances are a problem and if there's things that people really want to get for others to celebrate Christmas, I pray that somehow you would provide. Somehow you would give the provision for the extra food, for the meat, for, for the gifts, for something special as we celebrate you. And we ask these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. So I bless you today. I pray that, that as God's anointing flows through, that you would feel strengthened and that you would feel hopeful and that you would feel excited about who he is and what he's doing, regardless if you could see the specifics or not. And that's kind of where we're going to jump in. We were talking last week about everything that was going on behind the scenes, that, that Christmas doesn't start with the birth of Jesus. It started way before that. And then specifically, we jumped on board with Elizabeth and Zacharias, which was a very important part of ushering in the birth of Christ. Because their son, their miracle son, John, known as John the Baptist, he was the one that was going to prepare the way of the Lord. And we, we talked just briefly about that he, he had the spirit and the power of Elijah. And I wanted to kind of go back and, and kind of unpack what was that? What does that mean? And can we have that? Okay, I believe that the spirit and the power of Elijah was this fearless, surrendered, obedient testimony of the Lord. That uh, it and of itself, the whole focus of it was to turn people back to God. It was to turn people's hearts to God. It was to reconcile and reconnect. And in one of Elijah's famous um, stories is when he confronted the prophets of Baal. And that's in 1 Kings 18, starting in verse 37. Well, the whole story starts in verse 20, but I'm going to pick it up at verse 37. Basically, they were mocking. They were saying, who is God? Who is Yahweh? Who is, who is your, your creator God? And Elijah's like, he is the one true God. And the prophets of Baal wanted to kill him. And they wanted to say, no, no, no. Our, our God, Baal, he's the best. He, you know, they were prophets of him. There are 450 of them. And there was one. Elijah. And it says, Elijah's praying to God, answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned back their hearts, their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering. So what they did was Elijah said, okay, I'm going to prepare an altar and a burnt offering before the Lord. 
and you prepare whatever you want to prepare an offering before your false god. <laughs> and so they both did that. And then whoever the whoever whoever's offering the fire fell on, that would be the true god. So God, the God of the Bible, the creator, basically it says in verse 38, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering that was Elijah's and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench because Elijah was so convinced that God was on the throne, that he is the eternal one, the king of the universe, that he says, you know what, you can do whatever you want to my altar. And they poured water all over it. And there was a trench and they continued to pour until the trench was full. And all of that still could not keep the fire of God away. Verse 39, and when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Amen. No fire fell on their sacrifice because it was always false. Anything outside of the one true God is false. That is the spirit and the power of Elijah. And that is what God gave John the Baptist to do the same exact thing in a different time with different people. So Isaiah and Elijah were in the Old Testament. Elijah is the one who wrote about Isaiah or <laughs> the opposite. Isaiah in the book Isaiah. Um, no, first Kings. Okay. I'm totally sorry. I'm thinking about Isaiah for a whole nother reason, but in Kings, that's when Elijah was living and that's where his story is recorded. Um, but John the Baptist lived in the new Testament and he was before the coming of Christ, but he was given a similar mission to turn the people's hearts back to God. And we have that same invitation. We have that same call to turn people's hearts back to the Lord, back to the Father, to bring them to Jesus. That's the heart of the Lord. That's, that's what we delight to do when we walk with God. And it, it's not about just getting by working enough to make a living, living in comfort, going on vacation, getting the things we think we should have or the things we deserve. No, it's, 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 life is not about any of that. And it's so much easier to let things go when, when we are before the Lord and we're like, Lord, I'm your child, I'm your servant, and when I obey you, you call me your friend. So as your friend, show me where to go. Show me what you have for me to do here on this planet, in this life. Because the reason this message is called Behind the Scenes is because there is always so much going on behind the scenes, behind what we can see. And that's exactly how it was before Jesus was born. And so going back to the story of Elizabeth and Zacharias, who had the son, John, John and the Baptist, and what he was told, it says, now in those days when Gabriel had appeared to him in the temple and told him the promise of God. So after that, his wife Elizabeth conceived and she hid herself for five months saying, thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked upon me to take away 
my reproach among people. See, we talked in session one about that she felt shame. And in that time, it, it was kind of a common thought that people that didn't have children were not blessed of the Lord. And so she apparently carried around that reproach that that was a part of what she had to wrestle with and what she had to deal with. And in God giving her a miracle son, well advanced in her years, likely she was beyond menopause, and she conceived. And why would she hide herself for five months? I could only imagine that it was part of the giddiness, part of the, is it true? Is it true? I believe it's true. I feel this baby growing in me. I want to make sure everything's good. I want to, I want to be showing before I go out in, in public. I don't want people to be thinking, oh, there's Elizabeth. She gained, gained some weight. No, I'm pregnant. Like, I think I could only imagine. She didn't want to have anything else to try to prove or try to defend. Have you ever been in that place where you felt like the, God's given you something and you've told people about it and then you've had to try to defend it and they didn't believe it and you have all this faith for it, you have all this excitement for it and then after you talk to them, they kind of throw a wet blanket on it. I'm imagining Elizabeth just didn't want to do any of that. She, by the time she went out, she wanted to be clearly pregnant and have nobody um, doubt it or say anything against it. I don't know. That's just, as I, as I get into the story and I ask God to give me revelation on different things, sometimes it's those things that really touch me. Sometimes it's those little clicks that really impress my life. And sometimes there's wisdom in that. If God gives you something, if there's a miracle thing that you're believing for and you feel like you've gotten it, before you just go out and tell everybody, just make sure it's so rooted that when you present it, there it is for all the world to see and for God to be truly glorified. Okay, moving on. So, verse 26. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice! Highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled, saying, what, what manner of greeting is this? And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and his name shall be called Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Okay, so this was probably a bit confusing because Mary had never had sex. <laughs> she had never been with a man. She was not yet married to Joseph. She was betrothed to him. And so she's thinking, okay, so the angel is definitely from God. This is supernatural. So I need to lean in. I need to believe what he's saying. But how does this work? 
I think sometimes we look at the story and it's so familiar that we're just kind of like, oh yeah, that happened and then this happened. But if you really think about it, she was probably about 14 at the time. She, she loved God. She was no doubt raised in a godly home, a Jewish home. And she went to Sabbath every week. And she was familiar with having the, the Torah and, and the word read to her. And that was powerful. But then something like this happens and you're trying, she's trying to make sense of it. And so in verse 34, she said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also that the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. So the angel just basically said, I know you don't understand this. It's going to be supernatural. God's going to overshadow you. Now, I don't know if she fell asleep and then she woke up. I don't know if she went into like a, a spiritual connection with him or had a vision. I don't know if, if it was just something that happened like the snap of a finger and she conceived the child of God. We don't know the details, but the details here, that's part of the mystery. That's part of the glory of it. God did it. And it happened. The Virgin Mary conceived without any human interaction. That's a huge miracle. And, and then the angel continued to tell Mary. And this was like her, go check it out, baby. It's all good. Encouragement. Luke 136. Now indeed, Angel Gabriel is saying to Mary, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Ha <laughs> ha! Oh, how I love that. With God, nothing Nothing is impossible. All things are possible. And you notice here that barren was actually a, a label that Elizabeth had. So this was no small thing. This wasn't like today, a woman traveling around, you know, getting advanced degrees in college and just wanting to do things in the corporate world. And it's like, I don't, I don't, I don't care if I have kids. I don't even want kids. Okay. Well, a woman today in that situation, she's typically called ambitious, a go getter, you know, and those things can be great. They can be fine. Anything submitted to the Lord is beautiful. God's made us all for different things to do different things. But here in this time, Elizabeth was labeled with a name that felt like a curse, barren. She was barren. Oh, Elizabeth, the barren one. Oh, the one who doesn't have kids. Oh, she, the one in the hill country of Judea. Yeah. Yeah, they don't have kids. That was what she was known for. So even though um, Mary's family in Galilee, in, in Nazareth, um, lived about probably 70 or 80 miles from where Elizabeth lived in the hill country of Judea. And so I don't know how often they saw each other. I don't know if, and where they lived, where Elizabeth and Zacharias lived in the hill country of Judea was about four miles from Jerusalem. 
So I don't know if they made a yearly trek to Jerusalem and got to see their, their relatives then. That would be likely. Because when Jesus was 12 years old, they, they all caravaned up there and did that. So it would seem to, to make sense that they probably all did that every year. So maybe they saw Elizabeth and Zacharias once a year. But when the angel told Mary that God was going to overshadow her and she was going to have the son of God and that in conjunction with that miracle that Elizabeth, who was barren, was now six months pregnant. (laughs) Mary was so excited to go to Elizabeth and, and see her. So that's what happened. Oh, in verse 38, I do want to read this. Mary said to the angel, Behold your maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. May that be our response to everything that God gives us or says to us that seems impossible or seems way out of our reach. So let it be. Nothing is impossible, and we say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I don't see how that's going to happen. That doesn't make sense to me, but God, I want it. I want whatever you have for me. I want whatever your word says, because that's where life is. Okay. Now, Mary arose in those days and went to the hill country with haste to the city of Judah. Judea and Judah, depending on the translation, they're, it's both the same thing. And entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it, it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Now, it doesn't say that the angel went to Elizabeth and told Elizabeth what was going on with Mary. I don't know if they got any kind of postal mail or any if there, if there was any message sent ahead, because it probably took Mary a fair amount of time to get to Elizabeth. Days and days, if not weeks. I don't know how fast she traveled. She probably went with some kind of caravan and, um, and, and traveled there. But see, that's the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes in, people get prophetic knowledge. People know things that are supernatural. And that's what happened to Elizabeth. She she couldn't even tell that Mary was pregnant at this point. I mean, Mary wasn't even pregnant enough to have a baby bump, you know? And yet it she 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 knew. She knew something. And verse 43 of Luke 1. But why is it Elizabeth is saying? Why is it granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded to my ears, the babe leapt in my womb for joy. Verse 45, blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her of the Lord. I want to read that again. Blessed will be those things, the fulfillment of those things which were told her of the Lord. And I declare today that that's for all of us, for the things in the word and for the things in our hearts. Listen, that's for you. Take it personally. What has God told you? 
Maybe he's told you you're going to get free. You've been in bondage with sin. You, you keep drinking and you keep making promises that you're going to quit drinking. And you keep drinking. Or you, you know that God's calling you to purity and you keep getting sucked in to sleeping with your boyfriend or your girlfriend. Or every now and then you, you go to a party and you just get plastered and you do drugs or whatever. Listen, if God's, if God's told you he has something better for you, then there is freedom and you can get out of that lifestyle. Or maybe he's given you promises and he's told you things that are way beyond what you could even imagine. Maybe he's told you he wants you to be a pastor or a teacher somewhere. Maybe he wants you to open a home group in your house. Maybe he wants you to risk and step out and, and adopt a child or start fostering. Maybe he wants you to do something that just seems way bigger than you. Let's take the example of the Christmas story and of what was happening behind the scenes with Zacharias and Elizabeth and say, God's promised me. God said some things to me. And I'm going to believe that he is going to fulfill them. Because no matter what it looks like, God is moving behind the scenes in your life. So I just want to, I just want to stop there today and I want to pray for you. And I want, I, mean, I totally would love for you to join us for part three, because we're going to continue on with this next week. But today, Father, I bless these ones that that have this thing in their heart that they sense you want them to do and it just seems like impossible for them to do it. I pray that you give them strength and hope and the power of the Holy Spirit to, to go forth and do that thing. God bless you.